So I ask you the same question I asked the kids. Have you ever played the game Follow the Leader? Now, for some of you, it may have been a long time ago when you played this game. After all, it is a game that children play. But it's a game that children play because it reflects a truth that applies even to adults. That when we admire someone and follow them, we tend to mimic their behaviors, even down to the small things. And that's the basis of that game, right? Is to copy what the leader does. Well, Jesus is our leader. So today we're going to imagine what it might be like to follow Him, to follow Jesus throughout His ministry. And those of us now who know the story of Jesus, we know that if we engage in that task, it's going to take us to some scary and strange places, places that we maybe don't want to go or teaching us things that we don't want to hear. In fact, as we look at our gospel reading for today, we can see how Jesus was a very different type of leader to follow. His disciples regularly don't know what He is talking about, or at the very least, they don't know what to make of the things He says, and the text even tells us today they're afraid to even ask Him to clarify. Jesus is indeed a strange leader for the fallen people of this world to follow. And this kicks it off right at the beginning of our gospel reading today because it begins with Jesus predicting His passion. Here, right from the get-go, our plan to follow Jesus hits its biggest wrench of all. Can you imagine the person you are following telling you that they plan to go somewhere and that when they get there, they will be arrested and killed, and still they go? That's one movement any sane person does not want to follow. I'll flap my arms like a fool before I would follow someone into that. Now, the disciples have this sort of reaction. In verse 32, they react to the prediction of Jesus' death and resurrection by, like this, but they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask Him. Now, usually in a situation like this, I mean, you maybe have found yourself in a similar situation. When somebody says something that is a bit scary, the reason you don't ask is because you're afraid they really mean the thing they said. And here the disciples are afraid that Jesus really means that He's going to be killed. So can you blame them for their reaction? They're still men of the world after all. Their death to this life and their new life in Jesus was only beginning, and they still couldn't see what they were really a part of yet. Now we know this because the next couple of verses, Jesus questions them about what they were discussing amongst themselves as they were walking on the road. And for the second time in these few verses, the disciples are silent. The text tells us why in verse 34. But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who is the greatest. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Somebody asks you, what were you doing or what were you saying? And you don't really want to say because when you say it out loud, it's going to sound silly or foolish or even wrong. And that's most of the reaction we typically have when we read this. Our initial reaction is, how silly of them, how foolish. Don't they know what Jesus is going to say when He finds out? But actually, if we think about it at this point, there really isn't any reason for them to know the radical nature of Jesus' ministry, particularly when it comes to the point He's bringing up now. After all, He just revealed to them the core event of that ministry, his death and resurrection. And they, quote, did not understand the saying. Jesus is a strange leader, after all. Thus, not only is it not surprising that the disciples were arguing about who is the greatest, it makes perfect sense. That's the way the world thinks. And if you take a moment to reflect, that's the way we're naturally inclined to relate to one another. We do it all the time. 
playing the game of comparison to make ourselves feel better or more important. And what criteria usually comes to mind in that discussion? Speed, power, strength, influence, intelligence, and beauty are what we value. We record the names of the fastest, the strongest, the most intelligent. They're who we hold up as examples. If you just watched the Olympics, you don't know any of the names of the people who finished last, do you? Of course not. We only know the names of the people who finished in the front because that's what matters to us. In our world, if you're extremely beautiful, you're treated with great importance on that fact alone. Having more of all of these various things in our world is what makes you greater. So we understand the conversation the disciples were having because we have it ourselves. Now, it may not be couched in such ridiculous terms as, oh, I was arguing with my brother as to who is the greatest. But we probably argued about who's the smartest, who's the fastest, who has the most influence. The list goes on and on. And like the disciples, the thing that we don't understand is the teaching of Jesus. Now, at this point in the text, Jesus, of course, understands the disciples are completely lost. In fact, He's probably found Himself in that scenario many times already and knows He will find Himself in it many times in the future. Can you imagine the patience it must take to deal with people like us? when He teaches us things plainly and we don't understand and we're afraid to find out. They've heard what He said to them, but they don't understand. Their discussion of who the greatest demonstrates this clearly. We can say at least that their silence indicates a rightly ordered conscience because at least they're ashamed of the discussion they had. Yet, like when we try to hide our own sin from God, it doesn't work. Jesus knows what they were talking about. And what is his reaction to their sin and their stubbornness and their ignorance? He mercifully teaches them once again. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And I have to imagine that after saying that, the disciples are even more confused. Now, this doesn't seem as strange to us. We grew up in a society founded on the ethics of the religion we follow. But in the ancient world, this is the fast way to get killed. You have to be strong. You have to fend for yourself. You have to get what you need. Worrying about being the servant of all and the last of all. How much you want to bet that nothing like that was anywhere near the conversation the disciples had just concluded. They weren't arguing about who was the greatest by saying, well, no, I helped you the other day, and I I set aside my wants and desires, and that makes me the greatest. Because no one thinks like that except Jesus. Now, how would you demonstrate to a group of people who thinks that power and speed, beauty, intelligence, productivity and influence are the most important things that they have it exactly backwards. If you were to go about convincing that group, how would you do it? Well, Jesus decides to give a children's message to the adults, and He took a child and put him in the midst of them. And it just so happens that the object lesson for this children's message for the adults is a child. What better object to raise up as the ideal candidate to emulate than a small child? Or maybe it would be better to understand if I put it to you in a different way, maybe a more relevant scenario. Imagine that you and your best friend are the captains who get to choose the team, uh, the teams that will compete for the game of soccer at recess. What Jesus just showed as the leader to His disciples is that if they want to mimic Him, they should search out for the least capable and most dependent people to be on their team first. Did that ever happen at recess? Of course not. 
Again, I bet that a child, or being like a child, had nothing to do with the conversation the disciples had just finished about who was the greatest. Why would it? In the world, children are considered inconveniences. More accurately, they are considered inconveniences because they aren't capable, they aren't fast, strong, and influential. In fact, they just need so much. They need so much time, they need so much money and energy, they need so much resources to care for them because on their own, they're helpless. That's why our world often views them as an obstacle, as a drain on your own life. Because according to the world, they're not valuable, they're not great, they're not worthy. Yet here we have our leader, Jesus, raising them up as the prize of His ministry, the thing He most seeks after. He's telling His disciples that in order to be great, they need to receive ones among them like these small children, the least, to serve them and to make yourself last in the eyes of the world. Now, the truth that Jesus is beginning to reveal to His disciples is that this child is actually them. They probably haven't picked up on that yet, but Jesus received them, those who were least, and placed Himself last, almost to a ridiculous degree when you get into the details of Jesus' ministry in the Scriptures. It isn't just that He picks some sinful human beings, He picks uneducated fishermen, He picks people who are of no consequence in the world, and He's been doing that since the Old Testament when He went to the smallest clan and found the youngest son of the poorest family and used such a person to bring about His will and work in the world. He's at it again, making Himself last for the sake of the least is the heart of His mission and the core truth of His passion prediction that the disciples did not understand. They don't understand because they don't see themselves as dependent children that are being taken up into the arms of Jesus. That's why they were arguing about who is the greatest. You don't have that argument when you understand that you are a helpless and dependent child. It just doesn't occur to you. They are still stuck in the illusion of thinking that they are great. Imagine at this point in in Jesus' ministry, they think they're going to become important people in His kingdom and that they're going to help others with their wisdom and their knowledge and their station. And Jesus is telling them, no, 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 that's not the way this works. Now, if you're like the disciples and somebody has asked you a question when you've been talking about something shameful and you don't want to share there's some benefit for you here. Now you understand why you felt ashamed. You understand why the disciples felt ashamed when, they, when Jesus said, hey, what were you discussing on the way? Because it turns out that human beings were not created to push other people down to define their greatness. That's why even though we're fallen, a part of us always understood that. It's also the reason that when you have made the sacrifices you've made for the sake of others, for your children or for those in need around you, that afterwards you feel really good. And not from some sort of selfish, hey, look at me, I did a nice thing. You just feel good. And maybe the first time it happens, you don't really understand why you feel good. Well, Jesus is giving you a clue here. It turns out that human beings were made to lift up others before themselves. It's part of how we were supposed to be wired until things got gnarled up with sin. But Jesus has come to lift the veil from our eyes so that we can begin to see the truth, the virtue and the joy in serving the lesser. In our newly redeemed lives, Granted by the Holy Spirit, this shouldn't come as a surprise because it defines our relationship with God in Jesus. Just as what Jesus is teaching here applies to His disciples who were involved in the conversation, 
It also applies to us. Jesus says, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. One thing that I've heard that I think is true, and I think it stems from the fact that our culture that we live in grew out of a Judeo-Christian faith, is that you can judge a culture by the way it treats its children. Now, that sort of conviction and accusation only holds water for the Christian because the world has never cared for the least. And nor did we until Jesus came along to show us so that we could follow what He was up to. See, Jesus is teaching us not only how we ought to view others, especially those who are least among us, He's also teaching us about how God sees us. That in His grace, He deals with us in this exact same way. For indeed, we are the least. We, whether we realize it or not, are totally dependent and hopeless on our own. Like the child who is at the mercy of all the adults in his life, so are we at the mercy of God. Even the way this took place, you can tell the child didn't really have any say in what was happening to him. Jesus just grabs him and plants him in their midst. He's dependent upon the mercy of the adults that are there around him. This is why the gospel is called good news. It's called good news because it comes to a people who are hopeless without it, to a people who can't see themselves with any truth or others until Jesus comes along to lift the scales from our eyes. So it is such good news that God in His mercy sent us Jesus, Jesus who receives, serves, and loves the lost, who was indeed first the very Son of God and made Himself last of all and servant of all for the sake of those whom He loves, the helpless children lost and alone. Today He's teaching us that we should do the same that we should follow His lead. As strange as it looks to us, it is the right thing to do. And it is, in fact, the way we were made. But He doesn't just leave us with this command, but He also gives us a promise that when we do this, we receive Him and the Father who sent Him as well. So despite, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the strangeness of the sayings and doings of Jesus, we should follow our leader, our Savior, and our God, for where He leads is life, love, and hope for the least, of which you and I belong. In the name of Jesus, amen.